all persons having business before the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding over the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please be seated and come to order. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, virtual District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Uh, we have two cases on this morning's calendar. The first case is Henderson versus United States. And after we hear argument in that case, we will uh, take a brief recess for the panel to reconstitute itself for the second case. Uh, with that, let us proceed with Henderson. Counsel? Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Anne Keith Walton on behalf of Appellant Lorenzo Henderson. And I would like to reserve three minutes uh, for rebuttal. Mr. Henderson respectfully requests this court to reverse the trial court's order, finding that he consented to the search of the hood of his car. Whether a person voluntarily consented to a search includes an evaluation of the totality of the circumstances and also focuses specifically on the individual person involved, taking into account the person's subjective understanding of the situation and his particularly vulnerable position. As captured on the body-worn camera videos of two police officers, Mr. Henderson did not voluntarily consent to the search in this case. The burden was on the government to establish by a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Henderson voluntarily consented and the government did not meet its burden. Furthermore, the government has raised alternative theories to support the search, including probable cause based on a 911 call, inevitable discovery, and the public safety exception. However, these theories were unsupported by the record and are barred due to procedural unfairness to Mr. Henderson. Turning to the video, which is the main source of the facts that we have in this case, Mr. Henderson approached his car in a heavy police presence with three officers who were already surrounding, surrounding his car and one officer looking in it with a flashlight. Mr. Henderson approached and the police officers immediately ordered him can you pop the hood? And then they repeated, can you pop the hood? Mr. Henderson, as your honors can see on the video, then opened the door, pulled the latch, closed the door, and began walking away. As you can also see in Officer Bitteretti's video, body camera video, the hood did not actually open upon the pulling of the hood latch. It remained closed. And well, is it right that it didn't open at all, or did it kind of pop up some, but not all the way? On Officer Vitoretti's uh, video, I think it clearly shows that it didn't even raise even a little bit. You don't think it, it budged? It doesn't look like it budged, no. But and can I ask you, you, you described uh, the evidence as being that the officers, I think this is the way you said it, ordered, can you pop the hood? And... The, the grammatical form of that, which seems to have a question mark at the end of it, uh, 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 and the trial court's finding, which I think was not that it was an order, make me wonder about whether uh, the evidence supports the use of the word order there in, in your comments. So could you say what you think, um, well, A, you agree the trial court didn't view it as an order? Well, the trial court, first of all, the trial court actually characterized it um, first as a request, Second is a question and also characterize it as susceptible to another interpretation. Um, there wasn't actually a clear finding that it was just an open-ended question. And the main point here is not the form of the question, it's um, the question or the request under the circumstances and how Mr. Henderson uh, in his vulnerable state subjectively in this situation would have interpreted that phrase. Um, Sharp versus United States uh, addresses a situation where a police asked uh, a person to get out of his car, um, but did not order him. And that was not, the form of the phrase was not considered determinative of whether or not it was a seizure. Um, just like in that case here, uh, the, the, it would have been the same had the officer said, pop the hood um, in the circumstances that it couldn't be considered an open-ended question where Mr. Henderson could just say no and walk away. 
Um, well, Mr. Henderson actually did feel free to walk away uh, ultimately, but did, um, is the Sharp case a case in which the ruling at issue was about the voluntariness of a consent and our review was deferential? Or is the Sharp case a question about whether there was a seizure and our review was de novo? The Sharp case, I believe, was about a seizure, but it's also about the Fourth Amendment. And though there's no case that I found that's directly on point to a voluntary consent, and we look at cases from this court that are similar um, under the same framework, which here is the Fourth Amendment. And in this case, um, the clearly erroneous standard uh, does apply to issues of voluntary consent. But that's when the trial court is, is really finding facts based on hearing the testimony, um, judging the credibility of witnesses, being able to evaluate the witnesses speaking. And here you actually, rather than hearing the facts, you actually, this court can actually see the facts. And so the finding of the trial court, um, besides uh, briefly touching upon the testimony of the two witnesses, their whole facts are, are completely determined by the video. And, and respectfully, um, Mr. Henderson- I thought you were relying on what was going on in Mr. Henderson's mind, which is not shown by the video. And that's where the testimony comes into play. Um, I think in the beginning of all of this, uh, the trial court does say that consent will be a hurdle, a considerable hurdle for the government. And then we have the testimony of Officer uh, Vitteretti and Mr. Henderson, where Mr. Henderson specifically testifies as to his, his, subjective, his subjective state and his particular vulner, vulnerability, which is being a, a black man confronted with three white police officers, which you can all see on the video, um, in this situation where, uh, as he testified, where he had just witnessed a week earlier someone being uh, beaten by the police on the street. He had seen his friends being handcuffed on the ground, face down on the ground. Um, he had his own bad experiences with the police. And so- If all we had, if I could, if I could just ask you, if sure. all we had before us uh, was the video and we didn't know, we didn't have any testimony from Mr. Henderson about his experiences with the police as a black man, um, would you see anything coercive in this? Would you see anything indicating that there was not consent? Well, I, oh, yes, Your Honor. I don't see anything indicating the contrary. Um, and, and Well, the officer, what we see in the video is that the officers don't confront Mr. Henderson. He confronts them. He wants to know what's going on. And um, an officer asks him the question in a normal tone of voice, can you pop the video? Okay. You pop the um, hood, and he asks, "Pop the hood." I'm paraphrasing now because I don't have the video exactly in front of me. But I think the question was a question: "Can you pop the hood?" And the officer said, "Yes, that's what I'm saying." And so Mr. Henderson then reached into the car and did what he had to do to pop the hood. There doesn't seem to be anything coercive about that confrontation if we don't know what people are thinking. But that's when you're not uh, taking into consideration what was going on around Mr. Henderson. It, it, a shooting had just occurred. He was at a large gathering to commemorate um, a friend's death, the anniversary of a friend's death. A shooting occurred. Uh, he, as he testified, he was already scared, as anyone would be after a shooting. Um, he, then he, he didn't just approach his car with three officers just kind of hanging around. Um, he approached his car with a police car sort of blocking um, one part of the road and then the officers standing way in front of their car in, or to the side of his car where he really couldn't just go to his car. Um, yeah. your Council, to let me ask you to focus on that point in time, if you will. This was important to the trial court. And uh, the fact is that your client approached the police. He was not stopped or detained by them knowing this chaotic situation was going on, he put himself into the encounter with the police. Do those facts inform the question of voluntariness of consent, or do they go only to the question of a Fourth Amendment seizure? 
The fact that he wasn't actually detained, that would be, I think we would be discussing a seizure rather than a search in that situation. Um, here we have, that's just um, one part of the totality of the circumstances. Um, and I think we also just have to consider the case law that very clearly states that um, we have to consider the individual person involved and, and his subjective state, his particular vulnerabilities. If, if I had had such bad experiences with police officers, I think I would have walked in the other direction rather than approaching them. Yes, but we do have to think about Mr. Henderson specifically as an individual and how he testified and his position in the community, his you know, longstanding belief that um, he had to submit to the police officers that he would just do what he was told, otherwise he feared the consequences. Um, I think he described his fear uh, on a scale of one to 10 as 15. Um, voluntary consent requires that the court does take into consideration this testimony. Um, well, in your view, does, um, is it relevant whether the police um, knew anything about Mr. Henderson's particular experiences and uh, feelings and vulnerability? Whether the police knew it well? I mean, you um, would look at the police in this case and they had no information about Mr. Henderson's prior experiences that you've just been describing. Yes, but the focus is on, on Mr. Henderson's experiences. Um, okay. I wanted to draw the court's attention to James Oliver, US 618 A2D 705, mm -hmm. um, 1993 case, um, where it was very important that, um, that uh, the defendant had um, actually been confronted by these police before. Um, and so his subjective understanding of the situation was that when the police had confronted him before, it, was, it wasn't, um, you know, question of choice that he had, and the court focused on the subjective factors here. Um, now, so, in this case, yes. in this case, the court, as you say, did focus on the suggestive factors too. The court took into account and said that it didn't ignore Mr. Henderson's subjective experiences and feelings. It said that they were outweighed, taking into account the totality of the circumstances by the lack of any coerciveness and the overall voluntariness of the encounter. How can we say that was clearly erroneous? Well, because your honors, I think in this case, um, it's, it's very unique because this is a body worn camera video that actually captures all of the facts. I, this is a very, uh, as your honors know, a very um, new policy to always have the body worn cameras. Um, and there are cases where there, the clearly erroneous um, standard applies, but um, if the facts aren't supported by the record, uh, the trial court can still, I mean, the appellate court can still reverse um, the trial court's findings. Counsel, can I ask you, uh, uh, at times it seems like what you're saying today is that we shouldn't apply a clear error standard because the critical information is on the video and we can see the video just as well as the trial court. Are you arguing for a different standard review or is your point a different one that although it's still a clear error standard, uh, the fact that you know, uh, we should look at the video and we you know, uh, uh, have better access than we might to some of the information. I just couldn't tell whether you're formally arguing that the clear error standard shouldn't apply because we have access to the video. Well, I'm arguing that the clear error standard does apply to voluntary consent, but in this case, is, is a, I'm also arguing that this is a unique case where the trial court's findings of fact aren't based on, on the testimony or what they're just, you know, there's no actual findings on the credibility of the witnesses. So for example, where, where this court owes you know, total deference to the trial court on credibility findings, we don't have that here. So in this case, the Court of Appeals does not owe as much deference to the trial court as opposed to this, this other type of, you know, classical cases we've always had without this video evidence, um, if that makes sense to your honor. Okay. Uh, well, um, you wanted to reserve a few minutes for rebuttal. Yes. Which we will give you. So let us hear from the government's counsel and then we'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Carroll. 
Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court and Carol for the United States. Um, at the outset, I, I agree with the Pellin's counsel to the extent that the clear error standard applies because a finding of voluntariness and consent is a factual finding that is made in the first instance by the trial court. An appellant has failed to establish any clear error, either based on the body-worn cam body camera footage or on any testimony that was presented at the hearing. First, I, I, I would like to go back to the actual words that were used during, uh, that is depicted in the body-worn camera. And the best video for that was Officer Vitoretti's. And it is at 2.43 to 2.50 in that video footage when appellant who had walked up to Officer Julian, who was standing beside the, the, the white Jaguar. Am I still there? You are still yes. here. Because for some reason, my video just shut out and I thought I just, had left the meeting. <laughs> we we okay. are still here. Okay. This, we've okay. noticed Thank that you, we Honor. occasionally have these problems. Okay. Uh, my Thank video you. froze a few minutes ago. And, okay. Um, so at 240, I'm sorry, at 243 on Officer Vitoretti's body worn camera footage, appellant had already walked up to the three officers who were just looking at the car. Um, there were other people on the street. Appellant had come in the direct, which is visible on both Officer Lazarus's and Officer Vitoretti's um, video. They were further down the sidewalk and Appellant came from that direction, walked up to um, officers and, and starts to say words to the effect of, is, this is my car, I just came in to check on my cousins, just check, in, check on my family. Officer Julian turns to Appellant and says, is this your car? Appellant answers that it is, and then Officer Julian says, quote, hey buddy, can you pop the hood for us, unquote. To which Appellant immediately responds, pop the hood, and then without further, act, without further question, walks over to his unlocked driver's side door, releases the hood latch, closes the door, casually walks away, and then walks across the street and leaves. Now, Appellant's actions, as the trial court found, displayed unambiguous consent to release the hood latch. And as an objective, reasonable um, observer, one could only construe that action to mean consent to search under the hood, not the entire. Can I ask you about the scope component of that? I, uh, a, pre a prefatory question, which is, as you were just framing it, it sounded as though you agree but I want to be explicit about this, that our review of the scope question is de novo as a question of law about the objective reasonableness of conclusions about the scope of uh, the consent. Is that right? Do you agree that that, unlike the voluntariness issue, this is a question of law we would review de novo? Well, it is, it is an objective reasonableness standard. And I think that, that the trial court in the first instance has to make a factual finding of objective reasonableness. And well, I, I guess I'm, 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 you're hanging me up there about a factual finding of objective reasonableness, like objective reasonableness for probable cause. That's a legal finding. So that's why I, your brief di didn't expressly argue for deference as to that ruling. Um, and I just uh, and calling it an objective ruling, uh, uh, an objective inquiry seemed to point in the direction of de novo review. But your brief wasn't explicit either about that. So I want to see if we get explicit about what your view is about the standard review for that issue. I, I think in, in my review of the cases, I didn't see anything that explicitly said that other than that the issue of consent was a factual question that is subject to clear error. And that is why we framed it the way we did. I didn't see anything explicitly talking about the standard of review when it's the question is the scope of the consent. So you're not sure about what the I, correct standard I, is? I can supplement that, Your Honor. At this no, point, I, I just I'm, wanted to know what your position is. Your position right now is that you're not sure, but you're not conceding that it's de novo. Is that I'm fair? not conceding that it is de novo because all of the cases that we cited did say that the question of consent is, is a factual question that is subject to clear error review. And this does seem <laughs> to be encompassed within the scope of that finding. And can, so I ask would you, gotcha. can, can I ask you, can I ask you then about the scope issue, um, uh, I, I want to give you a hypothetical, I guess, 
to, to see how you would analyze it on the question of scope. So imagine that I am in my house and the police come and they knock on the door and they say, uh, we're looking for you know, a suspect who we think may have entered the house. Uh, will you open the door? Can you open the door? Hey buddy, can you open the door? And I open my door you know, three inches have I, the, the police have indicated why they want me to open the door. The, it's obvious that they're hoping to be able to have the door open enough so they can see whether there's someone inside or not. Um, but I choose to open my door three inches. Would you say that I have consented to the police pushing the door open the rest of the way? I think that's a, uh, I, I, I think that hypothetical is not analogous to the situation. Well, maybe I, I so, maybe not. We, we can, no, no, yeah, we can definitely talk about whether it's analogous or not, but I'm also interested in what your answer is to the hypothetical. I think that the fact that he, the, the person at the door opens the door in response to the police request to open the door does suggest that he is consenting to opening the door. I do find opening it the important. door as far as he chose to or opening the door as far as the officers might wish to? I, I mean, this is the difficulty that I have with this hypothetical, if, if you'll forgive me, Your Honor, that, that the defendant in, in your factual hypothetical is still in control and there isn't any kind of um, expectation that one would have that when you pop the hood, you look under the hood. I think that's I think that's such a strong distinction in this case and one that the court of the, the, the trial court focused on and that other courts have focused on in this context. Okay, I so think that when you bring you me to a I'm house. I'm really struggling with that hypothetical and I, I haven't got a direct answer yet, but that's fine for now. Let me just give you another variant because you seem like maybe it was hung up a little bit on the, uh, uh, some features of the hypothetical that are not critical to it. So imagine instead I'm walking down the street and I'm carrying a backpack uh, or a briefcase. Let's say it's a briefcase. And the police say, you know, we got a report that there is someone who kind of matches your description, who, uh, uh, you know, has a, uh, some contraband in a backpack. Do you mind opening your backpack? Hey, buddy, can you open your backpack? And imagine that the suspect, uh, me, I guess, in this hypothetical, uh, puts the backpack down, you know, uh, uh, or holds on to the backpack and opens it a little. Um, not all the way. Would you say that the suspect has consented to opening the backpack the rest of the way, because like, what else, why else were the officers asking? I, I think, yes. And I, and I go back to, to Brown, and I go back to other cases by this court that once the, the, the defendant puts something into the view of the police officer, a reasonable police officer could construe that that was consent. Well, that, no, but those cases do have a different analytical form in that if the police say generally, uh, like in, in Jimeno, uh, can we search your car? Well, if, if I say yes, and the question is, is everything reasonably within the scope of what I've said? Right. Um, if this is a different situation, and maybe the outcome should be the same, but it just seems different if the police make a specific request, will you pop the hood? And right. the person complies with that specific request. And the issue is, is that an implication for the pol to uh, permit the police to do something more than the way in which the suspect complied with the, the specific request. And that just seems like a somewhat different set of issues that I don't know that any of the cases that you've cited shed much light on. Maybe some of them you think do. Well, but well like there, was, there was one, there was one uh, report. Yes, yes. The there's the magistrate, there's, yes, the magistrate decision, uh, that is definitely uh, of a piece with this case. But, but our cases seemed uh, not, they seemed all to be different in that way where there was a general request and then kind of ambiguous uh, 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 conduct about, well, okay, what does that request mean or what would an off, you know, approval of that general request, what does that mean reasonably? But I just, none of, other than the magistrate case that you mentioned, they don't seem to have this, the form of if the police ask the suspect to do a specific thing and the suspect does that exact thing to the extent the suspect chooses, when and under what analysis does that mean that the police can infer that more was permitted, you know, that the person was consenting to the police doing more rather than saying, okay, you asked me to do something, I did that. If you have a more, if you have a further specific request, then you better ask me. Let me go well, back to Judge McLeese's hypothetical of opening the door, because it does strike me this has a mixed, has the quality of a mixed question of law and fact. If the police come to your house and say, we think somebody's just run in 
you know, an escaping felon, whatever. Would you open your door? And the person opens the door. Well, I think that's consent for the police to, it may not be consent for the police to enter the dwelling and search around, but it's very reasonable to say it's certainly consent for the police to look in and see what can be seen. And it strikes me that one could look at the request here in a similar vein. They're outside the hood of the car. The hood is closed. Could you open the hood of the car? That's what pop the latch means. He opens the hood of the car. Well, it may not be consent to go in and look around and root around the engine, but it seems to me that it's very reasonable to say it's consent to look at what opening the hood um, reveals. And that's all that happened here because as soon as they opened it, they saw the gun, then they had, then they had all they need. Um, that's how I'm sort of looking at this. Um, now, there's a factual component to that inquiry, which is what does the question mean to a reasonable person? And then there's the legal component. How much, what is the, uh, if, if the person consents to that question, what is, what does a reasonable officer think the police are allowed to do? And it would seem as if the police might be going a little bit far to say, well, it allows us to root around the engine and look under, you know, the, the, the water cap and everything else. But, but we can certainly look and see what we can see when the hood is open. And I think that's how I'm approaching this. I, I agree, Your Honor. Th this was a very limited intrusion. And the, it, it was entirely friendly exchange. Appellant approached the police officers. Officer Julian and Officer Vitoretti hadn't been looking at him and didn't even realize that he matched the description provided by the 911 caller. It was only Officer Lazarus, who was on the radio and standing by the hood of the car, realized it. What do so, you do with the fact, let's assume it is true, that, that because I think the judge assumed it was true, that um, Mr. Henderson has had uh, extremely unpleasant and scary past experiences with the police. He, um, this has a, this whole encounter has a racial overlay that um, strengthens uh, Mr. Henderson's feelings of um, intimidation and um, uh, lack of complete free will. Um, he looks at this and thinks, yeah, I can, I can tell the police to uh, go take a hike and um, what will happen to me if I do. Um, where, how does that factor into your analysis of whether there was uh, free and voluntary consent here? Well, appellant, as the trial court noted that um, one appellant never testified that he'd although he had witnessed interaction. And so there was, there was some fear on his part. The trial court recognized that and considered that. And he said, weighing against that was what he watched on the video in itself. And, and this was the other issue I took, one issue I took with uh, um, Pellin's counsel is it is incumbent on the trial court in the first instance to evaluate the evidence presented and find facts. And based on his view of the body-worn camera footage, he found unambiguous willing consent in, in large measure because appellant approached the police and appellant didn't simply acquiesce to a, re a request to open the hood. Appellant himself walked up and took the physical act himself. It wasn't as if he was kind of standing back and letting the police do what they had essentially commanded him to let them do. He did, was the one who just walked up on his own, did it, walked between well, two officers. It's a little, I mean, fair enough I, to a degree, but they did ask him to pop the trunk. It's not like they asked, you know, can we pop the trunk? And he had done it himself, kind of volunteering. He was, they, their request to him was for him to They, they did, but, but the def appellant responded by walking between the officers, unlatching the hood, closing the door, and then walking away and then casually walking away out of reach before running away. Appellant exhibited his understanding that he was free to leave. He, he walked away. He testified that in fact, he did not consent to opening, opening the hood. 
And so, so even his, even his testimony wasn't that he, his will was overborne. His testimony was, I just did it because they asked me to, or they, according to him, they told me to. The trial court found based on the, the video and apparent, what, appellant's apparent behavior that his will, his action was voluntary. And therefore, well, his, his testimony implicitly in effect, rejected appellant's His testimony, testimony in effect is, yeah, I did walk up to them. I recognize I did that. But once they asked me, I felt I had no choice but to comply with that request because they were the police and I was um, uh, a black man with the experiences I've had uh, with the police. I, I, I'd go back to Appellant's um, motion to suppress in the first instance where Appellant cited that essentially he was taken off guard by the request. And, and that seemed, if you look at the body-worn camera footage, Appellant seemed to just be reacting to the request. And it may be, and again, this would be speculation. This was not addressed specifically by the court, but the police were looking at his car. It's possible Appellant thought they're looking at my car because it's parked so close to the crosswalk, which the video shows. And then when he was asked to pop the hood, maybe that did take him off guard and he reacted by simply agreeing to do it. But there's no question, according to the trial court, he agreed. He walked up and did it of his own volition. There was no force exerted. There was no harsh language. There was no display of force. There was nothing that the police did to, to coerce appellant's response. And appellant's you, argument Carol? essentially seems to be that race alone can provide that coercion. And this court has never held that. Even in Dozier, where that subject came up, the court was specific that it is a totality of the circumstance, it is a circumstance that can be considered by the court, but it is no singular fact can cause involuntary finding. Ms. Carroll, should we view the trial court's finding that he, based on watching the body worn camera, the trial court's rejection of appellant's testimony that he felt intimidated by the police? Should we view that as a finding of credibility regarding his testimony? My argument is that consist anything inconsistent with the court's finding um, in terms of appellant's testimony is a rejection of that testimony. I mean, the court evaluated, a court considered appellant's testimony and said, but I'm looking at the body-worn camera footage and everything I see on that suggests that an appellant willingly acted on his own volition in response to the question. And Can in I fact, specifically found it was a question. Ms. Carroll, Ms. Carroll. Yes. May I ask you a standard review question uh, yes. about that? Because your opponent has suggested that to the extent the trial court's finding on that exact topic you were just discussing, but more generally about voluntariness, uh, rests on the trial court's viewing of the body-worn camera footage, that really we should Practical. Uh, uh, this may not. This may be a paraphrase of your opponent's argument, and she may want to word it slightly differently. But one way of reading it is that we really don't owe it quite the same degree of deference uh, because we have the body worn camera footage, and we should look at it ourselves. Do you agree that the art, the availability of the body worn camera footage for us to review, affects our standard review in any way, or do you think no. really it, 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 it we still need to not so much say here's what I would have done as a fact finder seeing that body worn camera footage, and instead say we're going to defer to the trial court's assessment of the body worn camera footage. Which do you think it is? Uh, the, pro the body worn camera provides the, this, this court the opportunity to assess whether or not there's clear error. And that is the standard of review that is required. The trial court in this case evaluated the demeanor of the people on the video. He de evaluated the testimony of the live witnesses and considered all that evidence in making his factual findings. The trial court in the first instance is the one to make those findings. This court has often refrain from take usurping that role of the trial court. And there's no reason under the, in this case, that this court should change its standard of review. And in fact, what the trial court did was evaluate his, um, evaluate the demeanor, the tone, 
the, the evidence that was available to it from the body worn camera. And this court has the opportunity to find that it is supported. Those findings are supported by the body worn camera, as well as the evidence in the record. And appellant has cited nothing in either the body worn camera or in the testimony that would, would support his claim of clear error. In fact, the trial court's findings are amply supported by all of the evidence. Okay, thank you. Counsel, we have your argument. And um, let us hear from Ms. Uh, Walton on rebuttal. Ms. Walton, give you three minutes. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, turning to this, um, this uh, clear air standard, um, we discussed that uh, in, my, in my initial argument. Uh, we turned to the scope of consent. Um, I believe Judge Flickman addressed it as a mixed, mixed question. Um, I think the standard here is not as clear from case law. Um, and I'd like to, the, for, the, for the court to consider this. Um, again, like I said, um, traditional clear error cases have the trial court um, evaluating the credibility and the demeanor of witnesses um, and, and all of their factual findings depending on actually what plays out in court. But here your honors can see the actual video and that's where the facts are, that's where the objective facts come from is the video. There's nothing additional in the trial court's rulings. He does not make credibility findings. And I think the government said in their brief that they, he made implicit credibility findings. We can't just go in and try to, to you know, um, invent what the trial court was thinking. Um, this doesn't turn on the trial court's version of what happened. Um, this is, this, is the, this court looking at the video and being able to make, um, make a decision really um, based on the law and, and not under the clear error standard. Um, as we traditionally know it. So I would call it a mixed question with, especially since we get into uh, scope of consent and that's really where your honors uh, were mentioning the um, crack in the door and peeking in the bag. This is exactly, exactly that situation. Um, here, as your honors can see on the video, um, pop the hood, Mr. Henderson pulled the latch, the hood did not open. So it didn't even, come up a little bit. It, there's a few seconds, clear seconds, where it just remains closed. So it's not like Mr. Henderson walked over and lifted up the hood for the officers to look in. It just didn't lift up. So uh, Officer Lazarus just pulled the whole thing up and then he actually gets his flashlight and starts looking around. In this situation is unusual as well because when the police officers just ask a person on the street um, could you pop your hood? And we all think of that as going to the car mechanic, um, checking your oil, checking your coolant or whatnot. Um, this is a- did, did Mr. Henderson testify as to what he thought, as to why he thought the police were asking him to pop the hood? He stated, he, he explained, um, no, he, he didn't, he didn't explain why he thought they were, they were trying to, um, exactly. He, he, he said that they were, uh, as a car mechanic, he understood um, pop the hood to just mean pull the hood latch. And that was, again, his subjective understanding. Um, as an Well, I mean, he didn't think they were testing out whether the latch worked. He didn't testify as to specifically. He just testified but, that it was an order. And leaving aside, kind of aside what he subjectively thought, what would a reasonable person have thought? You know, it's one o'clock in the morning, there's some police looking around a car um, and you walk up and you start talking to them and they say, can you pop the hood? What, what, what other reason, I mean, the trial court's view of this was, what other, what, what reasonable person could have thought anything other than I guess the police want to look under the hood? Um, do you have some other reasonable understanding that someone, you know, that an objectively reasonable person would have had in that setting? Again, leave aside, you know, actual testimony in this case, but what other possible explanation would a reasonable person be considering? Well, when you go to the car mechanic, for example, and they say, pop your hood, you just pull the latch, you don't actually physically pull it open. Well, I get your point. I, I definitely get the point that by complying in a limited way, maybe that's what he limited the police to. That's a legal question that is of interest to me. But I'm just, if the issue is, was the trial court right to say the following? Anybody would have understood that the reason the police were asking him to pop the hood was because they wanted to look under the hood. Do you disagree with that point that the trial court makes? 
Uh, and if so, what other objectively reasonable explanation do you think someone might have had in mind uh, in thinking through, oh, the police have asked me to do this? Just to simply to the latch. And in this situation, if you close the door, you're not trying to open the hood. And I think as the government said, he simply re responded to a request. It was a split second. Um, there was no, can you open the hood? I think if somebody, if they had said, can I open the hood and look in, it would have been clear to Mr. Henderson. But this is a really unusual situation where police are just surrounding your car and asking somebody or requesting them to, to pop the hood. They're not saying, it's not like a trunk where you're saying, could you open the trunk? Could we look inside? Um, it's a really unusual situation. It, I, it probably doesn't happen often on the street where an officer just says, can you, you know, pop the hood? Um, what an you know, it, it strikes me that although we're talking about the scope, what, what you're really saying is that he just obeyed, did what the police wanted without really thinking about what it signified. That a reasonable person on, you know, the deer in the headlights there would have acted in this way. And, it, and that's really an argument that he didn't consent to anything. He just did what they told him without really right. thinking of what it meant. Well, that's possible, that is, that it is possible. But that, then you run into the, the, the um, courts finding otherwise, that, that looking at the totality of the circumstances, there was a consent here. And um, I, I don't know if you can get away from the totality of the circumstances analysis um, based on and the clearly erroneous standard of review for that question. For the initial question. For the, for, the, for the initial question of whether he was consenting to something. Well, there is the further question regarding scope. So uh, our position is that he didn't consent to any of the interaction um, because of the totality of the circumstances and his vulnerability, his subjective state. But then when we, when we get to scope and we, we shift to objectable reasonableness and a mixed question, uh, it becomes even more difficult for the government to meet its burden. Your argument is if, if he consented to anything, it was no more than consenting to do the action that was requested of him without any conception of what that action implied or allowed yes, he was, to do. He was reacting to an order. Uh, imagine if he had said no. I, playing out in his mind, what if you said no and walked away? What would be the consequences? especially in his situation as a black male confronted with three white police officers. There's no possible way that he could have just said no without in his mind facing some terrible consequences. And we do when judging- Wait, 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 wait. In, I mean, it's one thing to say in his mind, he would think if I say no, they will suspect me. Uh, and maybe they'll even have probable cause if they, uh, given what else they know, who knows? They will, they will suspect me, they might arrest me. They might, they might stop me. Um, I don't think that's enough. If that's all we're talking about, I'm not sure. Do you think that's enough to render the consent um, invalid, involuntary? I mean, if he thought, if I say no, they'll beat me up, um, that, that would be a different story, I suppose. But I don't know that he necessarily thought that. There's no evidence he thought that, I don't think. Well, Your Honor, that was his testimony is that, I mean, he had witnessed people, I think, a week before being beaten on the streets. And that was his automatic, he said, automatic built-in fear. Um, we can't just discount that in the context of voluntary consent, um, because there is this subjective factor under the circumstances, which I submit is the most important thing to look out here. Um, the subjective state of Mr. Henderson. Uh, it's not just the totality of the circumstances, traditional factors. And Dozer does add this, this extra factor of race. And though it's not determinative of the case, it is an important factor to look at. And Mr. Henderson's background and what happened that night, a shooting. And I go back to your honors can see the video. You're not usurping the trial court's position or findings of fact in this case, because you're able to actually see it, not just hear it and judge the credibility of the witnesses. Um, this court can find as, as that the trial court erred. Um, matter of fact, they erred. Um, they just got it wrong. Um, okay. Yes. Counsel, thank you both for the, for the arguments and the case is uh, now submitted. Thank you.
Uh, we will take a recess now to 